This is Connor Braid. Welcome to Canadian Rock. All right, beautiful. And uh, that was a nice little intro there for Connor Bray. Connor's our guest this pod uh, here at the Canadian Ruck. This is Jamie Gray, as always, uh, talking to you about some rugby with the main focus on Canadian content. Connor, uh, stellar athlete, played at the 2018 Commonwealth Games, also representing Canada at the 2018 Rugby World Cup Sevens. He also rep Canada. He's very versatile, played at the 2015 Rugby World Cup. Uh, the 15s aside, he's you know took home bronze at the BC Rugby Sevens, and he's currently prepping for the 2021 Olympics. So we wish Connor all the best, and we'll get to him very soon. So stay with us as we run through some things here. Uh, the main one here for uh, next on tap is the contact aspect, and uh, we're on the Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and email. Twitter, we're at Canadian Rock. Instagram, the underscore Canadian underscore Rock. Facebook, at the Canadian Rock. And our Gmail is CanadianRock at gmail.com. Make sure you hit us up, tweet, retweet, reshare these fantabulous. I think that's word. If not, it's just, uh, I'm going to trademark that one, fantabulous. Uh, we're going to make sure that you're constantly retweeting all these great rugby stories from all these awesome Canadian athletes that we have on here. It's great that they can uh, we can get their stories out and people can hear them. Uh, anytime you want to hear us, we're on the Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. And if you want to watch, if you want to see the recording uh, that's that I'm using with Zoom, the Zoom program, they're all going up on YouTube. And if you forget where to go, the simple thing is just Google us. It's the CanadianRock.Weebly.com, and we will appear, and you will see everything we have to offer. So let's uh, let's look at some rugby news. Uh, we're going to go focus a little bit here. On the local, we're going to look at some Canadian content first, and it's a it's a really interesting one, one to say the least. But uh, Rugby Canada Men's Fifteen, they're having a camp in November. Um, hopefully, most of you are already aware of that. It's been out in the news, chatting with Cole Keith a little bit. He's getting anxious to go. Um, main reason this it's just it's a it's a three week camp, I believe, is because there's no internationals, and obviously that's due to COVID, and that brings a lot of disappointment to rugby fans, uh, the players, the coaches. Everybody across the country is really looking forward to having some November internationals, but that's not happening. So silver lining is these players get to train together finally. There, there's a bit of relief there. You know, chat, uh, texting with Cole a little bit. He's a little just, you know, it's been hard sometimes because he's home by himself here in New Brunswick, having a hard time sometimes staying focused, but it's been getting better. So the relief aspect of that, that they actually get to train with their teammates and get to train with people that are trying to crack the roster is great. You know, and that also brings about the camaraderie of rugby and being together in that team environment, pushing each other and working together for each other and just being able to enjoy some laughs with some of your mates. And then also the intensity will pick up in their training. And I think uh, I think a few people have talked, uh, you know, touched on that. Is you know, it's one thing to be working out by yourself, but when you've got a bunch of other uh, teammates around you, the training intensity definitely picks up. And there's a lot of great names attending this camp, and a lot of friends of the pod are going to be there. So Cole, as I mentioned, Doug Frazier will be there, Ben Lesage, Patty Parfrey, Matt Heaton. So there's some past guests, and also on the coaching side, Kingsley Jones will obviously be there. And uh, Kingsley, just love to pass on our condolences to you on the passing of your father. Uh, we wish you uh, nothing but the best moving forward. And hopefully, hopefully, um, you know, <laughs> it's always hard to, to wish somebody, uh, you know, sorrow in their, in their time of grief. But we wish to you the best moving forward uh, once you return from New Zealand. Uh, other coaches that will be there and friends of the Potter, Jamie Cudmore, Phil Mack, and Aaron Carpenter will be there as well. So good luck. Uh, lads, as you take on that uh, November November uh, training camp and uh, and really enjoy your time together. On the international side, and this was our gray area of last week. Springboks, Springboks are out. Uh, they they've withdrawn to uh, they've withdrawn from the rugby championship uh, 16 days prior to the first competition. So just over two weeks before they were first to pl uh, first set to play, they've dropped out and. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's disappointing. They're they're legitimate. They have a legitimate reason. Like just the complexities of COVID. That's uh, it's tricky to get around. Uh, you know, New Zealand's in pretty good shape. Australia, I, I'm not really sure the numbers in South Africa. I think they're in a little rough rougher shape than those other countries. Same as Argentina. And I think just player welfare is what's being cited. We want to make sure that our players are looked after the best. And that will leave only six tests now for the rugby championship, which are being held in Australia. 
Uh, there is a game on tonight. Sorry, last night. I'm recording Saturday, but the pod's going to be posted on Sunday. Australia, New Zealand, the second uh, match of the Bledisloe Cup uh, will be happening tonight. So tomorrow morning when you all get up, you know, hopefully I've watched it or set your PVR so that you can watch it. It was a 16-16 draw last week, and uh, both both teams are going to come out eager looking to, uh, looking to take advantage there. But as for the spring box, uh, I imagine – disappointment from the players from the coaching staff but also from you know the kiwis the aussies and the argentinians um springboks are defending rugby world cup champs and they wanted to test go up and you know test the medal against them and that's not happening uh the players of south africa i imagine are really disheartened but what can you do right these are strange times the uh, south africa rugby rugby union chief executive yuri ru actually said this it was a nice little quote this is a hugely disappointing outcome for our supporters and commercial partners, but the ongoing pen impacts of the pandemic mean we are unable to deliver a Springbok team without seriously compromising player welfare, apart from other logistical challenges. So we basically saying like, yeah, we want to be there, but due to the pandemic, we don't think in all consciousness it's a great thing to do, so we're going to keep our team home. I was reading another article as well, and it seems like South Africa fans are relieved by this. And when you read the headline, you think, okay, they're really concerned about their player welfare. But as you actually read the article, um, they're more concerned because the box actually haven't played a mean, any meaningful rugby since the Rugby World Cup. Not just the Springbok as a team, but the players themselves because they didn't have a Super Rugby competition. I think there's only been a couple of matches played in Super Rugby un, uh, Unlocked, I think it's what it's called in, in, in South Africa. Nice name, I like that one. Um, so they're more concerned with their teams not going to be up to par. Plus, they're really concerned because the Lions tour is supposed to be happening in 2021 in South Africa. So they're really concerned that the South African team is prepped and ready to go for the Lions tour more than being prepared for the rugby championship this year. And lastly, on the international stage, this is a spoiler alert if you haven't watched the game or if you've PVR'd it and haven't seen it, but the uh, European Ch Champions Cup, if you haven't watched it, you don't know the score or the outcome, hit mute or fast forward about 30 seconds, uh, but would like to wish hats off to the Exeter Chiefs on winning the European Champions Cup as they beat Racing 92 with a close game, 31 to 27. Uh, very thrilling match, you know, huge, huge congrats to the Exeter Chiefs. They've been uh, an up and coming squad for a number of years. They've just been making those steady progressions. And uh, this is a big feather in their cap for winning this one. So congrats to Exeter. And the gray area. So the gray area, uh, we're not we're not into one right now. I might I might think of something throughout the week, um, but we're just going to look at last week. Last week, uh, the gray area was about the rugby championship and whether that should proceed if South Africa drops. And over ninety percent of the uh, respondents said yes, it needs to happen. Even you know even now, even though South Africa is officially pulled out, and there's lots of names that are gone into the draw. And we're going to go right now to a drawing on this, this website called Wheel Decider. And we're going to see who the winner is of a Canadian Ruck Took. Uh, lots of people had some feedback on the Twitter and the Instagram. And I've got, I think I most everybody's name. Hopefully I didn't forget anybody. But we're going to give this little wheel a spin, the Wheel Decider, to see who wins the Took. And uh, we'll get that sent off to you once we get your address. Here we go. And Jenna Eisner. Jenna, congrats on winning the Canadian Rock Took. I'll uh, hook up with you. I believe you're on Instagram, and uh, we'll see if we can get that sent off to you here pretty soon. Thanks for playing, everybody, and uh, might have a couple more Tooks to give away before Christmas. So, Jenna, enjoy. And so, congrats to you, and uh, congrats to everybody else, and thanks for, uh, for uh, taking part in those polls online and offering a little bit of feedback. Um, so, coming up now is Connor Braid. All right, so uh, welcome, Connor Bray. Connor's uh, hanging out with us tonight. He's out in uh, beautiful British Columbia. Uh, Connor, thanks for joining us on the Canadian Rock. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things, so I'm pumped to be here. That's awesome. All right, so let's jump right in. So you're a good BC boy, uh, hotbed of rugby in Canada for sure. Talk to us about your your development, like your junior age rugby, your high school, how you get involved in the national programs. Talk to us about that process. Um, yeah, I mean, BC is probably, you know, stereotypically a hotbed, uh, just because we can play all year. But I uh, got into got into rugby in, in high school, grade eight, maybe a little bit of grade seven. Um, 
and just started playing club as soon as I could, U, U15s, U16s, things like that. And then, um, yeah, there was a Canada tryout. Or no, there was uh, regionals. So, you know, Vancouver Island Tide team, which got you a shot at the BC team, which then got you a shot at a selection for a, a Canada camp. Um, so I did that kind of trajectory from, you know, Canada U17s. Uh, I think I played BC U16 and BC U18, which gives you like kind of a shot into the, you know, those, uh, those age grade Canada teams and made some of them, didn't make some of them. Uh, yeah, managed to go on both U20 teams for my years. And then, um, you know, I was playing with James Bay and getting a, a decent amount of time um, in the premier setup kind of at a young age, paid my dues a little bit, playing U19s and Div 1 at the same time. Uh, and then, and I got uh, thrown into the premier team pretty young, like 20, 21, getting some taste. And, um, yeah, I ended up getting a card uh, from Garrett John. Uh, he was a good guy back in the day. Um, and, yeah, that was kind of my trajectory. So, I mean, I played James Bay rugby uh, through and through. I think they didn't have a, a junior team one year. And I went and played with uh, Roger Robinson over at Castaways for uh, – which was like, yeah, we didn't have a program. So uh, the kids wanted to play, the kids got to play. Um, yeah. And then he remember Raj being like, you better not leave, like you're staying here kind of thing. <laughs> and then the next next season, as soon as James Bay started up again, we all, we all went back. Um, but yeah, that was kind of it up into, you know, I think I got uh, carded at 19, 20, um, still playing some under 20 stuff. And yeah, just kind of stuck with it from there. Okay, so what was your first cap experience like? First cap was Belgium on a uh, European tour. It was interesting one. I just had uh, like a few days before we were supposed to fly out. Karen Crowley told a couple of young guys, listen, you're coming for the first week. After that, they went on to Spain, Georgia, and Portugal. And... Uh, he said, you're going to come for the first week and you're going to fly home. And then my wisdom tooth came through that week. So I got it pulled on the Friday and then I flew on the Saturday, just kind of trained all week. And yeah, I managed to get 20, 25 minutes at fullback, I think, uh, in my first game, which was cool. And the Belgium crowd was awesome. It was like a small old soccer stadium. They were right on top of you and they were pumped. So it's beautiful. Um, yeah, that was yeah, really cool. Um, yeah, so right in Brussels and um yeah man it's, i haven't really thought about that in a while but yeah it was it was a good time it was interesting so i flew home they went off and played spain uh andrew monroe went down with some sort of injury and kieran crowley called me back and he's like you got to get back on the you know <laughs> get back through uh through frankfurt and, and over to us so um pretty much it was an interesting couple of weeks like i just had no con concept of time um <laughs> I, you know, I did seven days over there, eight or nine hours time difference, came back for a week, slowly got readjusted, then went straight back over to Georgia. It took me two days to get there. Um, and I got thrown in, I, I arrived Tuesday. Um, so I'd been capped, you know, two weeks before. And I've been trapped, felt like I've been traveling for two weeks. And I got in, arrived Tuesday morning. It's just like, yeah, yeah, you're starting 10 for Georgia. Um, which I was pumped for and, yeah. and, you know, definitely had like, uh, you know, decent amount of, of confidence at that age. And uh, just was like, well, you know, they don't have anyone else. So, like, let's just kind of give it everything. Um, and the week before, Georgia had played Russia. <clears throat> and the Georgians and the Russians, if you're a history buff, obviously you don't get along very well. And so it's a two-tiered stadium, two bowls. Uh, the week before, they had, you know, sold-out arena. Um, but the Georgians and the Russians started fighting on the field and the Georgian crowd joined in. So the next <laughs> week we, we played, they changed their, their policies. So they only had the upper bowl filled and it was just all swat around the field and all upper bowl. And they're like burning Canadian flags. And wow. I was pretty excited for the game until we took the bus ride down there. And it was like, it was hostile. That's um, crazy. Very cool, but it was hostile. And yeah, so thrown right into the, right into the mixer, right into the deep end from uh you know, 20 years old trying to figure it out that was only like 10 years ago too that's nuts yeah yeah so, they've had a, a pretty crazy uh a very different um 
kind of trajectory to Rugby Canada over the last 10 years for sure. Yeah, there's actually um, a few weeks ago, the uh, vice president of Georgia Rugby shot one of the former players at the uh, head offices of Georgia Rugby, shot him in the leg. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. with a gun. Yep. <laughs> yeah. so I read that and I'm That's like, wild. Oh, yeah. I don't get that. <laughs> Yeah, there were some interesting like cultural differences for sure. We were walking yeah. around. Tbilisi is lovely. Uh, like the architecture is amazing, and you know it was November, but it was still kind of warm. Um, yeah, it's a different part of Europe for sure. And you know, I remember we went out uh, after the game. We lost like twenty three seventeen. We were pretty. Uh, yeah, we were. We were. We should have won that game, but a tough place to play for sure. And you got like a twenty year old kid at fly half. It wasn't. Uh, you know, I did some good things, did some bad things, but uh, we were out after the game and I remember our liaison, this Georgian guy, he used to play a bunch of rugby and he's kind of like, he's taken us to like the good, the good bars and nightclubs and safe places. Just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, safe, you know, safe places. There was some, pla yeah, some, it was pretty sketchy when you look back at it, but he pretty much goes like, you know, he's like, are you looking for girls? You want to talk to girls? And I just said, yeah, sure. Like, I'll talk to girls. Absolutely. And he's like, okay, so in Georgia, you don't go talk to girls. If the girls like you, they'll come talk to you. But don't just go talking to girls because there's a good chance that her boyfriend is right there. And <laughs> that's not allowed. So I remember just going in there and be like, I am not even looking at anything <laughs> in here. Just to stand, drink my drink, not cause any trouble. Sounds like a, sounds like a different night than what you're probably used to. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> different. Pretty different. But then again, you don't have to go out trying to spit your a game you just got to stand there and hopefully they like what they see fair enough yeah all right so uh, let's let's flip back to rugby a little bit here back in uh, 2015 with Kennedy went to England birthplace of uh, rugby remember that uh, world cup squad uh talk to us about that experience for you like what were your personal expectations what were what were some goals you set were you able to accomplish them like what was the experience like what can you tell us about that event uh, 2015 World Cup was, yeah, the pinnacle of my uh, rugby career at the time. Um, worked, yeah, worked my ass off to get there. Changed positions a little bit. Kind of, you know, was being seen a bit more and from from normally at ten or fullback from Kieran Crowley, and he said, you know, I think, you know, in the centers might be a better fit for you. So spent uh, some good time you know, putting on a bit more size, learning the position a bit better, upping the physicality, things like that. Learning how to run the game from the second receiver, uh, helping out whoever's at 10. Um, it was awesome. It was amazing. Um, you know, we played Ireland in Wales, in Cardiff, Millennium Stadium, first game. Nick Blevins got the nod at 12. Um, I think we had six or seven warm-up games throughout the summer. And it was either Blevins played or I played. There was, you know, I think one game maybe Blevins was on the bench, uh, but it was either full stop, Connor's in the team or Nick's in the team. Um, so he was kind of like, you know, pick your horse um, for Crowley. And then, uh, yeah, so Blevins got the nod against Ireland. I'm just sitting there um, ready to go. You know, the boys took a bit of a, you know, 55-7 or so. I can't remember exactly the score line, but it wasn't, it wasn't, great uh and ireland were good mm -hmm. um but uh i got the nod against italy and I, here we go you know i went into it without a contract i got uh a pretty shit offer from glasgow they said it'll give you a two-year deal but you can't go to the world cup and uh i just said you gotta work with me on that a little bit i mean this is kind of the you know this is what everyone wants to do it's yeah. the pinnacle um tried to negotiate a bit and just go for the world cup and not play for Canada for a little while, maybe. And town Gregor Townsend just wasn't really having it. So I just said, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to back myself to get a contract. So minute and a half, minute and a half into the Italy game. Uh, I think it started off, you know, we dropped the kickoff. They run some phase play. I ended up getting kind of going out the back on someone and I got a good shot. He kind of slipped, but it looked like a big hit. Um, so I'm fired up. I'm right in the game playing at uh, I think Elland Road, Leeds. And then we kicked a touch. I run a dummy line uh, off a set piece line out move and I just get smoked by the 12 who I just hit. 
Um, so he was hitting me back, but I didn't have the ball. Hits me backwards into the their eight man who was running past, and my my jaw shattered into three pieces. Um, so it was kind of like a harsh realization, you know, you're up for the game, you're in it, and then boom, just like I'm, yeah, I'm hurt. I knew yeah. for sure. It's crazy what adrenaline does because I didn't feel any pain, but I definitely got my bell rung, and I could feel my jaw right. You know, split here and here, like clean cut, clean breaks. So I'm rattling around as I'm running around. And it is, uh, but I'm like, man, if I get taken off for an HIA or the physios know my jaw is in three pieces, I'm, my World Cup's done. So just keep going. And I told Hiriyama, I think I told DTH, I'm like, I think my jaw is broken. And they're like, no, you're good. Like, it's fine. <laughs> you're good. And uh, so I think I played, um, Till about the 13 minute mark and then the uh the doctor pulled me off for an hia and i didn't pass it uh, i couldn't get my scat three tests uh close enough to the baseline so they just said yeah you're not going back in so i said all right fine you should check the jaw out and then they just i watched the rest of the game from the ambulance on the way to surgery um so it was to make that squad it was about one of the hardest things i've ever done uh to get there be a part of it all was amazing like just yeah a stellar group of guys um good coaching staff um but to, the way it went down there i mean it's no one's fault it's just you know part of the game um yeah it was tough tough pill to swallow for sure but i uh so i'd broken my jaw and i'm talking to the surgeon who did my surgery and doing some checkups afterwards. And I just said, you know, when can I fly home? Um, and he goes, you know, two, three days, um, you should be good to go. And I was like, I need you to do me a solid. And he's like, what? I go, I've worked, you know, I, I was trying to get to the last World Cup, right? I was trying to get to 2011. I've been working hard at this for as long as I can remember. I'm here. We've played two games. We got definitely two more. So it's another two, two and a half weeks just tell my team manager that I can't fly for two weeks <laughs> so that I can stay with the team and go through the process. Cause they're going to bring someone else in. He'll take my hotel room, but they'll, they'll sort me out. Just do me a solid. And he's like, all right, man, I got you. No worries. So Gareth Reese comes in and it's like, so kind of getting the rundown. He's like, so he can't fly for at least two weeks. And he's like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right. The team's here for two weeks for sure. So I managed to, uh, to milk a bit out of it. And then Ardron did his knee. So we just, they put us in a room together and just kind of had a pity party for two weeks. Uh, I was going to actually ask that as a follow-up, like what did you do? You're injured and you know, some guys would go home and mend their wounds and stuff, but you basically told the doctor, like I'm staying, you've got to help me stay because you know, that's the team player that you are. Like, I'm assuming that you were going to the games. I mean, you probably weren't able to oh, cheer yeah. very well because your job, but I imagine the boys would have really respected that and, and uh, appreciated the fact that you were still there with them. Right. So. Yeah, for sure. I, I hope so. I mean, I, I definitely didn't, I was very cognizant to not be a distraction. Um, you know, the boys still were there. Boys were working hard. They had a job to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, at training for the first few days, I took it pretty easy. I was pretty heavily doped up as well. Um, just with it being a jaw, right. So, the pain is right in your head. So um, I had three titanium plates put in and I was just afraid of getting hit with a ball, to be honest with you. I couldn't wear, I didn't have a hockey helmet with a face shield or anything there. So I, uh, I remember like, I'd be watching training, but I'd be about 30 feet off the pitch, you know, away from everyone, away from a ball, just kind of uh, doped up on, on painkillers, just trying to, trying to get through the first initial bit of pain from the surgery. And then, yeah, after that, it was anything the guys needed. Um, you know, I remember being in before the French game and the Romanian game. Uh, we're in our number one, suited up, but, like, we're, we're allowed on the field. So I'm down there kicking high balls for Mebs and Harry Jones or, um, you know, just, just helping out shagging balls, um, helping out with meetings, doing analysis, stuff like that. Not Nothing over the top and just – pretty much just to be there, supportive, not a distraction. And anytime the guys needed anything, I was, I was pretty down to help or whether it was just play ping pong in the team room, stuff like that. But yeah, I didn't really want to go. I think my, uh, the depression would have kicked in pretty bad if I'd flown home and 
just sat there watching on TV. So at least I got to watch the games and uh, be with the boys and then, yeah, kind of cap it off because we worked so hard to get there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, that ties in a little bit here. You, you talked a little bit about getting screwed over a little with Glasgow, but you also, you did play a number of years professionally overseas. What was that like for you? Like, you know, you're kind of an outsider, outsider athlete in a foreign land. What was that experience like? How did that help you as a player? Um, ask a good question. Um, I guess I didn't really know what to expect over there. I went over first time to Doncaster Knights when I was 21, uh, 21, 22. And yeah, it was an interesting one. Um, probably went in there thinking, oh, okay, it's championship. Uh, you know, I can play at this level. I think I can play at this level. Uh, it's not test rugby, right? You know, it can't be, you know, I'd played, you know, Samoa and a couple pretty decent stern, um, you know, test countries. So I was thinking, you know, it'll be tough and it'll be a slog and the English rugby is forward dominated and things like that. But the big, the big kicker there is um, you have to, like any team, you show up, uh, you got to prove yourself kind of from the off and you got to prove that you can play. Uh, the big thing I found, lots of Canadians in the championship, mostly forwards, mostly, uh, you know, forward position players. So um, either that or you're like a winger or, um, yeah, there was a couple nines, I guess. But, yeah, really, I'm in a skilled position. I was going there. It was like 10, 15. I think I played pretty much across the back line except for wing. But, um you know, you're a skilled position player, so they don't think you can manage a game. They don't think, you know, he's Canadian. He can't play 10. There's no way he can play 10, right? He's not used to, you know, the caliber or anything like that. So, first of all, you have to prove yourself because you're a new guy in a new team. But that any Kiwi that shows up to story. play in England has to prove – well, they have to prove themselves. It doesn't matter what it is, right? Unless you got an all-black cap to your name. If you show up, you want to train well. You want to – it doesn't matter what your accent is. But then it was definitely the Canadian thing. It was a stigma around they're not going to be good, right? So it felt really good proving people wrong. And uh, I'm sure at some times I proved people right. But, um, yeah, once they kind of got over that and they realized that, you know, uh, you're a rugby player and you're, you're good at it, um, it was all good. But, uh, yeah, it was interesting. I had some good guys to kind of – lean on and ask for advice from, you know, DTH was a big one, big, big help for me. Um, being a James Bay guy, uh, didn't, didn't know him there, but you know, he's four or five years older than me. He was already overseas and he sent me a message when I was playing club rugby just first year at Prem's. And he's like, man, like looking at the stats, looking at kind of the numbers you're putting up. I was sitting behind a, an awesome forward pack, but uh, he's like, gotta get, gotta get yourself over here. Um, so once I got over there, you know, I was, um, still asking them about things you know uh are we fighting at training like what you know what do you do in this situation what do you do in that situation you know what would dth do which probably isn't always the number one thing to do but uh d, d gave some pretty oh 100 <laughs> old man. he's a great guy um yeah he's a really good buddy of mine and uh yeah gave me some really solid advice but that was definitely a, a learning curve, right? And then because I played on five different teams over there, I had to keep doing that. So I get to a place and, you know, okay, I've played in England now for a bit, but you still got to go and improve yourself and prove yourself again. And you get an opportunity, do you take it? Or, um, yeah, so I was lucky to get some good opportunities and kind of, I would say I, I was able to kind of grasp, you know, a good, a good amount of them, uh, some regrets, but, uh, you know, it's competitive over there and just trying to make it, you know, so that Canadians are, are respected over there. And, Cause a lot of the forwards are right. They're like, Oh shit. Do you know Jamie Cudmore? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what's he like? You know, he's the, in my time playing over there, you know, 2011 to 2015. And then again, in 2016, 17, everyone knows Jamie Cudmore. Yeah. Everybody knows DTH. They know these big Canadian names. So they know there's guys that can do it, but there's still, you know, some of the other guys that are just like, oh, Canadians are shit. Yeah. Right. Um, so that was a big hurdle, but it was also a good challenge. That's good. 
It sounds like you, there's a lot of that you learned from your time there. I mean, constantly having to prove yourself. You're showing your grit and your 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 capability to those English squads that you were with. So good on you for doing that and yeah, showing them that, that Canadians can play rugby. So definitely. But yeah. rec- recently, though, you kind of you transitioned from 15s kind of out to sevens. Um, talk to us about that transition going from the 15 side to seven side. Um, yeah, I went. Uh, so I broke my jaw, 2015 World Cup, came back home, no contract, uh, finished up the degree, started working uh, in commercial real estate here in Victoria, and was kind of thinking, you know what, I think probably time to to move on. And then Anscom, Mark Anscom was the Canada coach, called me a few times for a couple tours. I said no, and I was just starting <laughs> to play James Bay again, just finding my love for rugby again, playing club. Finally, he's like, man, you got to come. So I went. And then I managed to, we played England, or we played uh, Ireland in Aviva. Um, you know, we, the boys played well. It was a game for 60 minutes, 65 minutes. And then their, the cream kind of rose to the top. But um, it was a good game, you know, packed out Aviva, one of the coolest experiences, um, you know, I've had. And then I managed to sign a contract uh, with Worcester in the premiership. And so I went there, I'm 27 now, and I think I played, you know, we got one Prem game, um, and I played five European uh, European Cup games. And I'm holding the, I was there for, I don't know, November to May. I'm holding a bag for, you know, majority of the time, getting a couple, couple games, but I'm just, you know, you'd be a game, in the European thing, you know, maybe a game every week. And then, man, I was going on dry spells with no, no rugby. And I'm like, I can only really give you everything for six to eight weeks without any sort of reward. Right. Um, And I'm just thinking I'm 27. I've had a good run over here, played with some, some cool teams. Um, But if I'm going to, if I want to play and make an impact, um, you know, I think, I think that's, you know, the sevens route is the way to go. So I started kind of chatting. The boys are loving Damian McGrath, who's the head coach. They were heading on tour to um, Hong Kong, Singapore. And I'm chatting with him. I said, listen, I probably want to, I'm going to leave Worcester at the end of the year. I want to come back and, and link up with the sevens boys and try and make a push for the Olympics. And he's like, yeah, love to have you. No problem. Um, and then he's like, actually, we, we could use you on this Hong Kong, Singapore trip. <laughs> So I talked to my coach. The coach is no problem. Talked to Damo. Damo said, yeah, no worries. Like Worcester will, will release me for the two-week tour. I can fly out of London to Hong Kong. No sweat. And then Rugby Canada was like, oh, no, we've already booked the tickets, you know, for 12 guys or 13 guys out of Victoria. It's too much to cancel it. We're not going to send you. And then the boys go and they win Singapore, right? They win 2017, yeah. win the cup. And I'm watching that alone in England, like going – fucking mental at my TV and I was just sold right there like I was I was gonna go and Rugby Canada wouldn't uh wouldn't cover my flight Worcester signed off you know coach signed off everything and I'm just like you know what then it was just a sign I'm like the boys are the boys are happy playing well they're living in Victoria uh you know they're they're traveling you know great 10 stop tournament uh Vancouver's on it they're kind of the the pros compared to the cons were pretty high and I'd you know I'd, I'd, I'd given it a good shot over there um, and it's just like do I want to hold a bag into the twilight years of my career uh, in a prem club or a pro 12 pro 14 club or slog it out in the championship uh, or do I want to go home and play with some of my best friends and travel the world chase the sun all winter and try and go to the Olympics that was kind of my uh, you know that's how I weighed it up. So I, uh, I signed, you know, with, with Damo in the seven team while I was in England and just came back. And from that point I knew that okay, I'm trying to get to 2020. It doesn't sound like it was a tough decision to make. No, no, the boys winning that was really huge. And then I saw them like, you know, I've, I'd played, you know, three years of sevens maybe up at that point, you know, sporadic and, you know, watching Nady and Harry and, uh, um, you know, the older, the older dogs in the head and the team full of foul, uh, guys that I've, and Mooner, you know, guys that I've played a lot of rugby with, have a ton of respect for and 
and who have all stayed local, right, as in uh, domestic. They never went overseas. You tell me here in Yamathan, play professional in the UK or, yeah. you know, give me a break. Uh, the guy just didn't take the contracts because he, uh, for whatever reason, he's, he's in love with sevens, right? Um, um, but, you know, these guys have got a ton of respect for their game and their craft and how hard they work. And to see them win it, I was like pumped for them, but also, you know, probably a little jealous and just like, I want that and I want that with them. So I'm going. Um, That's fair. And then the Olympics is a big carrot at the end, right? Um, yeah. So that kind of ties into where we're going next. Like it's the Olympics were they're supposed to have happened already. Yeah. Obviously with COVID canceled, pushed to next year. Like how was that disappointment? How did you handle the disappointment? And like what are you doing to, you know, rugby's kind of down, but what are you doing to try and stay ready to prep for next year? Uh, I'll answer the first question. That was <laughs> – uh, it was a tough pill to swallow. Um, kind of knew things were trending, you know, not in a great way, but it seemed kind of, you know, out of sight, out of mind when it was based pretty much exclusively in China, uh, like COVID. And uh, yeah, we were in the States for LA sevens, prepping for van sevens, which is just a huge tournament for us. Um it's a really amazing place to play. It's also a scary place to play. You have everyone, you know, everyone's watching. I think the, I think Jones has like 150 people there. His family's enormous. You know, like uh, my family all comes over from Vic. And uh, I had 10 or 12 friends who bought like red wigs and dressed up like sort of like me. Um, they're taking the piss out of me, but at the same time, they're like, <laughs> you know, they're wearing my number on their back. And, um, <clears throat> so yeah, like you don't want to disappoint. And we, we have, we have that, right. We, we got pumped by some Moa last year. And that, although we played great in the rest of the tournament, that kind of wrecked our tournament. So, you know, it was just like, you gotta show up. We want to show up, um, to so play that tournament. And I'm like, okay, third bronze medal beat South Africa, Fiji, France, they're two, three, four in the world. Like if we're a dark horse, you know, on our day, we can, we didn't get to play the Kiwis that weekend, but you know, on our day, we can give anyone a run for 14 minutes. Yeah. Um, and then pretty much for it to get shut down, you know, the Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday afterwards was tough. Um, MLB or sorry, NHL shut down, NBA shut down. And then uh, those were the Wednesday night. I remember it pretty clear. And then Thursday evening, they said, okay, no training Friday. Um, we had the week off to kind of recoup. And, uh, and then it was just on, I remember just stocking up food and just being yeah. like, what, what are we going to expect? I, I didn't know what to expect. Right. Like, why am I buying baked beans? Cause I don't know if we're going to, you know, it was a weird, weird time for sure. And yeah, the thing was, it sucked. It was like a kick in the, a kick in the stomach. Um, but it was affecting everyone, you know, I, we couldn't sit there and whinge or oh, like our Olympics are gone because, you know, people's, people are losing their jobs left, left right and center. Yep. Um, so it was a very, like, uh, it was an interesting predicament because you just had that, um, why me initially that selfish, why me? And then you, you pay attention. Everyone's what I mean, I was watching way too much news at that point, but it was just, I mean, we got it pretty good. We're in Victoria. There's not a lot of cases. Um, you know, I have a roof over my head. I'm not, yeah, it was, it was a good perspective. Yeah. Uh, but from an athletic standpoint, it sucked because then we went and grabbed, you know, the barbell and some adjustable dumbbells and hundred kilos of weight and set up a, the closest thing to an Olympic platform I could in my living room and was just like, well, it looks like I'm training here for, you know, five weeks, four weeks until this blows over. Um, so tried to make the most of it, you know, some runs, uh, body was still banged up from sevens, but just kind of keep the body moving. And then, uh, then when, the, when they pulled the plug, you know, right when the COC said, we're not going boycotting and then Australian, uh, Olympic committee said the same. And then finally they just said it's done. That's when it was really like real is yeah. at least we were training 
from our living room for the Olympics, being like, how cool is this story down the road? Uh, you know, doing, you know, doing whatever power cleans in my part, my condo, um, trying to go to Tokyo. And then once I caught, once I killed Tokyo, I was like, man, what are we doing? So, um, I guess, yeah, not great, but pretty, uh, when you put it into perspective, not the end of the world. Um, good to have. Yeah. I mean, people are dying. Yeah. Um, people are dying. People are having their loved ones die and they can't see them, yeah. you know, shit like that. You're like, well, you know, I think I could probably wait a year to go and try to compete at the Olympics. Um, not to say it didn't hurt, but, um, yeah, big perspective. Um, and then in terms of staying fit and staying good to go, we, yeah, pretty much we did like about a six optional, all our training's been, been optional. Um, we, we've kind of said as a team, once we have a, a concrete start date, we'll go back three or four months from that. So say they said, uh, World Rugby said, we're going to play tournaments in April, 2021. So to avoid, you know, flogging the boys for eight or nine months, we, we need three to four months for a good preseason. We'll come in in January, mandatory. The boys will come in, we'll grind hard for four months before the tournament starts. Um, and then tournament play for a couple of months, maybe, and then into the Olympics. And that's just kind of how we're going to do it. So we did some gym work uh, this summer, went through, you know, six or eight weeks, took a little break. I took a bit of August off, um, you know, got some weekends away and reset. And then, um, yeah, just been training the, with, uh, yeah, there's a senior group of guys on the sevens team who were kind of given the, like an opt-in or opt-out option. Um, so you can come in. Uh, these are your times throughout the week, or you can opt out and we'll let some younger guys come in um, and train and we'll have a, a rugby group and a gym group. And it's all very, you know, high level in terms of cleanliness, of the facility and uh, the security measures they have in place for COVID. And that's obviously why they're able to, to run the, the center the way they're doing, um, but they're taking it very seriously, which is great. Uh, but for the senior guys who have been kind of doing it for a long time and have a lot of, uh, I guess foundation work in the gym and skill work and, and stuff like that. They've been kind of just said, you know, here's your program. Um, you know, make sure you're doing what you need to be doing. And the nice part is we have a, a good senior group of guys who know what it takes to what you need to put into it to be ready to go on, on the world series. So, um, yeah, just been, uh, been lifting, doing a lot of, uh, kind of like conditioning, type uh, classes and stuff like that. Uh, I go through kind of waves of running or, you know, hit, hit cardio, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough. It's like, you don't have that, that date, right? So you're kind of like, well, I know season starts in April. <laughs> What's that? Seven months away? It's a long ways out. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I can go, I can go wreck myself or I can do like, you know, there's, the periodized training is kind of tough when you're eight months out and you don't have to, you know, it's tough to, to look at it and it's not easy for Matt Barsay or SNC coach and guys like that, where you have to look at it from how do we keep them fresh? How do we keep them fit enough now so they can get fit quickly? How yeah. do we, how do we, like, what do we want to work on? Like maybe for a guy like myself, um, it's not the same work on as a guy like Josiah Mora or Dave Richard or Jake Teal, right? There's some younger guys who need work in other areas that I, you know, maybe mine's a bit more prehab and to fix a couple of the older injuries I have and keep the speed up. So it's a, it's a lot of juggling, but uh, it's kind of just keeping sanity at the moment and training, <laughs> not for the sake of training, but training for a goal. But that goal is nine months or eight months away. Yeah, so it's it's been strange times for sure. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's a simple process at the moment, but... Uh... It sounds like, um, you know, with your SNC and what you guys are trying to do, it sounds like you're staying on top the best as you can. So I think that's yeah. all you can ask for, keeping your mental state safe and healthy and your body's in best shape you can getting ready for next August. So good, exactly. good for you guys. Exactly. All right. So, Connor, we're at our section that we call the quick fire. I've got about uh, 20 okay. questions. It's not supposed to make right. you think too much, but some, some guys actually do. 
first half okay. are kind of rugby and the second half are kind of personality. So we're going to jump, okay. we'll jump right in. First one, best team you've ever faced. Oh. Oh. Could be I sevens know, or fifteens Maori. up to you. Yeah. Uh, Ireland, Maori All Blacks. Uh, yeah, that's what I'd go with. Okay. Best player you ever faced? Oh. <laughs> this is this can't be quick fire. Um, <laughs> Quickish. Best player. Um. Played against Gordon Darcy um, at Leicester, Leinster. That was pretty cool because I just, yeah, looked up to him as a kid. He's Brian O'Driscoll's, you know, uh, probably helped out Brian O'Driscoll be the person he was. Other than that. That's a good name. I, yeah. Um, this is a very quick fire. <laughs> Uh, played against Artie Sevilla. Oh, that would have been. Uh, he was he was a freak. Yeah. Um, yeah, Bryce Heem. I uh, played with him at Worcester as well. I played against him for you know for a year of sevens when we when the sevens team was doing pretty good before the 2017 one. So 2014 15. Yeah, Bryce Heem's a freak. He's six foot five, faster than everyone. That's mean. a little scary. Yeah. Yeah, those guys are, are pretty studly, I'd say. Okay. I'll go faster now if you want, though. <laughs> it's all right. Next one you might have answered. It might have been one of those last two names. The toughest player you ever faced. And what I usually say is that it's the guy who has the ball coming at you one-on-one -on -one that you just you hope that they trip before they get to you. Alafoti Fausaliva. Okay. Uh, that was quick. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, scary. it's not the first time anybody said his name on here either. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh very scary. Played with him as well. Um, played against him for years on like sevens, fifteens, uh, English championship teams, and then finally got to play with him, and it was just a treat because he's a big mean boy. Yeah. All right, sevens or fifteens? Um, both. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> well, I know they're know. both. They're both like so important to me, but in different stages of my career, I would say. Yeah, fair enough. Favorite location on the World Series tour? To play Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, to chill out and enjoy. I really enjoy Cape Town, uh, yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah, I'd say those those three. Nice. All right. What was the best match that you were ever a part of? Um. Really enjoyed playing against Glasgow with Canada over in uh, Halifax after we just, I just played a season with them mm -hmm. and didn't get my contract renewed, played them and beat them. That was enjoyable. Um, really enjoyed, uh, you know, the last two years at Van Sevens beating Fiji. It's a huge Fijian contingent that comes out at every tournament, but in Vancouver as well. Uh, those are cool feelings. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I got off the top of my head. That's two good ones. What's your favorite yeah. rugby tradition? Um, Post-match. Uh, whether it's, you know, travel, you're on the bus, you know, having a beer with the guys. Um, the dressing room is always a good time after a win. Um, really enjoy the camaraderie that you, you kind of share with the other team. Just go beat the shit out of each other for 80 minutes um, and then jump into a, a dining hall and uh, whether it's, you know, test rugby or pro rugby, you're in a dining hall or whether it's just the clubhouse for a beer afterwards. Like, I, yeah, I enjoy that. That's the coolest part because you meet really good people and you may have thought someone was a dickhead when you played against them or you, thought they were great or thought they were not so great or whatever it was. And at the end of the day, you're all just people, right? So just yeah. getting in there and having a, having a, a BS is in a couple of pints. That's probably my favorite part of it. Awesome. One of mine too. Yeah. What's the, uh, who's the best team you ever played with? 
Uh, Glasgow. What's your rugby nickname? Bredo. That's okay. Uh, Bredo or Rouge. <laughs> All right. Are you French? <laughs> no. 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 Right. Who's the player that you love to smash? Who's the player that I love to smash? Um, I don't know. I'll even go. I'll even go position. I've had some guys say it's not a player, but I really love to key up on the nines or the tens or the whatever. But you know, so if you have to go that way, you can. Okay, uh, probably back rowers. Okay. Um, I think like, yeah, there. I think some of the most athletic people I've played against have been like a lot of them have been in the back row, getting good shot. I remember one time we played. Uh, we played the Rock. Um, I was on Taiyi maybe, or maybe just BC at the time. But anyway, overthrow, John C. O'Toole bounces. He catches it. I was at 10. So I came in and just like, it was a big old collision. And I just remember, yeah, whenever that happens, you kind of give one of them, because they're, they're tough, right? Kind of give one of them a shot. It was, I'm not saying I smoked Chance or anything like that. I'm going to ask him It was a good that. collision. I'll give him a ask call him when we're done. Yeah. yeah, give him one. He lives um, about five minutes yeah. from me. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he was just an animal, right? So um, yeah. I remember just good collision with him and just being like, hey, I didn't get uh, knocked out or anything. So Bonus. Yeah. All right. Who, what's uh, any rugby superstitions? Um, I just no, I just wear a shirt under my jersey. It says my, uh, my, one of my best friend's names who passed away. Um, and then I just write my brother's name on my wrist. Um, he got sick uh, in 2010 with cancer and beat it, but I just started doing it then, and I don't—I've never played a game since without it. Uh, I've ran back in to to grab a sharpie and do it. Um, yeah, those are the two things. Other than that, no, it doesn't matter about the boots. It doesn't matter about the mouth guard. Uh, you know, things change. Everything changes, but you now those are the two things. Pretty cool, honoring a couple of people. That's really nice. Yeah. Who's, uh, who would be three people you would take on a golfing trip? Oh, um, they don't have to be rugby players. It can be anybody, but no, no. Uh, I would take, uh, Philly Mac cause he just, he loves it. He's a great time on the course too. Um, I'd take Jeff Hassler and I wouldn't take DTH because Jill would make him go home right after. <laughs> and so it will be a buzz call. I'd take someone who could stay out all night. And uh, yeah, let's bring Harry Jones if his missus would let him stay. Sounds good. All right, you know, what's, the, crew. what's the most used app on your phone? Um, probably. You look like a TikTok guy. I had, I've never, never downloaded TikTok. I don't know a thing about it. I kind of refused. I saw it and I just gave it the classic, like I'm way too old for that. That's good. Probably Instagram or, okay. e or my email. Yeah. Uh, email is, is a lot with work and stuff like that. So in terms of how much gets used, probably a bit more, but Instagram can get, I have a timer on my Instagram that notifies <laughs> me. It's like you spent 45 minutes in a day on Instagram. So do you turn it off when that happens or do you just ignore it? No, but sometimes it's like it, if it's, you know, 10 in the morning on a weekend or something like that, or like nine in the morning sometimes and I'm like, you've been 45 <laughs> minutes on Instagram and I just kind of, it, it makes me put it down for sure. I'm not saying I'll pick it up again later, but it's a little reminder. Sometimes it's 8 PM and you go, Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Fair enough. What's uh, what's your go-to food? Um, like cheat food? Sure. Or like, what do I? Rainy uh, day, you got a movie on, you're watching a game. Like, what are, you, what are you reaching for? Oh, I like pizza. Okay. Big pizza guy. Love the pizza. Big burger guy as well, though. Those are two dirty ones. Um, but yeah, during the week, I stick to try and stick to chicken and chicken and veg. And it's not that boring, but it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I try and keep it pretty, pretty clean. I eat clean so that I can eat bad things. That's fair. Yeah. All right. Love chips. a donut too. 
There's nothing wrong with donuts. You're Canadian. Yeah. All right. Chips or cookies? Cookies. What, what's your brand? What's your flavor? Um, man, there's just a bunch of good uh, coffee shops and stuff like that in Vic that do real good, real good work. Portofino is a bakery in town. They do really nice cookies. Nice. Um, Yanni's does donuts. Uh, there's a few good ones. The boys love a coffee and a donut, so we do that a lot. Sounds like a plan. All right. French fries or onion rings? French fries. French fries or poutine? Uh, I go French fries, although poutine's pretty good. Yeah. Most of the West filthy. Coast boys say just plain fries, but most of the East Coast boys say poutine. Yeah, it's good. It's just, it's filth. It's absolute filth. <laughs> All right, what's your favorite beer? Um, uh, go with a Lucky. I like a Lucky Lager. Okay. What series are you binge watching right now? Um, I just realized it's getting pretty dark. I just turned my light off. Um, I am watching The Coach's Playbook right now uh, on Netflix. So like Doc Rivers, uh, Jose Mourinho. Serena Williams, tennis coach. I can't pronounce his last name. Um, so I've, I'm on the fourth one. Um, NCAA women's coach now. I can't remember her name. But yeah, it's interesting. It's good. Okay. I have to look that up. Yeah, it's good. What's your favorite movie? Oh, uh, I really like The Departed. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, really like uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's fantastic. Nice. Um, what was your favorite one? Um, I think the Helm's Deep one, so that'd be the two the towers. second one, I think. Yeah, yeah that's a good two one. Two towers. Yeah. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Give it to someone. Hmm. Who's your favorite actor? I don't know. I don't even know. I've always liked the, you know, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Leo group. Those are kind of like the big ones of me growing up. Probably like, yeah. you know, in my younger years, the teenage years watching those guys. Um, none of them would play me. <laughs> um, I have no idea. We'll go, we'll go Brad Pitt. We'll just get him to dye his hair a little okay. bit. Okay, yeah. Let me just turn this light on for you. No problem. All right. All right, that's better. All right, grab the fire. All right, so Brad Pitt is playing you. Who's playing the leading lady? <laughs> uh, I always liked... Um, what's her name? From Blow... Oh, Johnny Depp and uh, Penelope Cruz. Penelope Cruz. I was yeah. like Penelope Cruz. Go That's her. a good pick. Last, last quick fire. What would the movie be called? <laughs> Bredo gone wild. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Maybe. Um, man, these are tough. I don't know. I might have to change the title of Quick Fire to something else here, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, it's probably, I probably had it for fifteen minutes or so. Yeah, these um, are the, these are the fun ones, though. Yeah, they are good. I don't know. We can circle back. We'll circle back. All right, all right. So we got a few questions left, just of the, of the standard kind here. So yeah, yeah. As a player, who had the biggest impact on you? It might have been more than one person, but is there somebody that you'd give a shout out that has helped you along your way? Um, yeah, it's, it's a bunch of, uh, you know, there's a few people who have been really, um, high level DTH was, um, you know, I think, I guess there was a couple people in stages in high school, Sean White, uh, went to the same high school. I was in grade 10. He was in grade 12. He was, you know, captain of Canada age grade and just a freak, uh, freak of an athlete, um, really good guy as well. So he was quite influential in my younger years up until, you know, 20 ish. And then we're playing on the, on the Canada team together, but it was kind of, from that point, it was kind of DPH 
um, you know, telling me, I still have the, I have, have this Facebook message you sent me from somewhere pretty much saying, you got to get over here. You know, you're putting up numbers that, uh, that will, you know, definitely hack it here. Um, and yeah, so kind of doing that and playing Canada. I remember I was living in Doncaster, took the train up to Glasgow for a weekend to stay with them. I watched them play Ulster. I'm thinking like this, how cool is this, you know, how cool is this Glasgow team? How cool is this place? And then, um, you know, two years later, I signed a contract with them. And then I'm there, I'm training and all the guys I met and went out for dinner with and, you know, they're like, hey, you're back. I'm like, yeah, and I just went and worked, just went and worked my tail off and managed to, to get a, a nod from Gregor. So I would say it's Sean White in my early days for sure. And then, uh, and then DTH just from a influence standpoint, they just were helpful and keen and eager to see me do well. So it's really cool that when you have those guys that can support you like that and motivate exactly. you and help you along the way. Yeah. I have a feeling I know the answer to this next one, but what are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? Um, I think you uh, need to be dependable. Um, you know, guys have to be able to trust you. Um, so whether that is your raw ability to do something, you know, your raw ability to make a play, or whether that's you understand the game plan or you understand – um, what you want to execute against a certain team in a certain area. Um, you know, not every freak athlete or, you know, not all the best players in, that I've ever played with are just freak athletes. They just understand and they are composed and they convey confidence, stuff like that. But I really do think being dependable and trustworthy when you're out there, that's a big thing, right? Because people get out of position when they think you're going to have to cover for you or if they do have to cover for you. Um, so being dependable, um, you know, I don't think you need to be, you know, especially in high performance, man, people are going to be, people are going to be straight up and they're going to tell you what they think. And, um, I had a couple old guys when I was young, just, you know, tear a strip off me a couple times. And I got to a point where I had to realize like, it's not personal. You know, this guy isn't out to get me. He's trying to get me better and trying to get me on their level. Um, although it sucked, you got to take it on the chin. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're not being attacked. It's just that you're trying to, it's a tough sport. So there's going to be some tough love. You know? That's a, that's a good one. Uh, I, I coach high school. I coach rookie rugby. I coach provincially for a couple of years, but yeah, things like that, when it happens, when you're, when you're an adult, it's easier when you're at the high school level, that's a different, different kind of can of worms, I guess, to try and deal with. Right. So yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a growing process there. Oh, for sure. Yeah. High school's, I mean, I don't know. I haven't coached high school, but. Uh, well, I mean, you played it, right? So it's a different, it's just. Oh, different I played it for sure. Game. And my coach, my coach is Murray Allen and he was like, you know, great guy. And, um, but yeah, brutal, like real stern, call you out for your BS, you know, take you aside and, um, you know, never really tell you you're doing well. You know, but you get a look or you get like a, like one of those and you're like, I fucking nailed that. Right. You'd be pumped, <laughs> but you'd hear about it if you did something shit. Yeah, fair. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was, yeah, I, I don't know. It's tough. This day and age though, high school, I don't know. I don't know what kids are like now, but when I was growing up, when I was in high school, you know, 16 years ago when I was playing junior rugby at 14, that's, it was, yeah, it was a hard ass, but I was like, oh, that's just rugby. Yeah. As a rugby player, what do you want to be remembered for? Fast forward 10, 15 years, 50, you know, 30, 20 years, your, your, your 50th birthday party and everybody shows up. What do you want those guys that you've played with to be saying about you? What do you think they're going to say about you? Um, yeah, I think, you know, those things that make a good team, I think people would be like, you know, uh, you know, we could depend on Braid. Um, I think that would be definitely something I'd like to hear that I was dependable. I was, you know, there for people when they needed it, whether I was on or off. Um, and yeah, I think, um, I'd like to be known as like, you know, solid, like a well-rounded player, right? Not, uh, 
not one dimensional and I'm not, you know, a crazy athlete by any stretch. I've just worked hard. I think people could say, you know, the guy probably didn't have all the ability in the world when he got into it, but he worked his ass off and he got to where he got to, uh, through effort and, um, and yeah, just being a good teammate, I think is what I'd like to be remembered for, for sure. I think that's commendable. So Connor, you're 30 now. You're, you're mentioning that you're in real estate. How many, how many years do you have, do you think you see yourself playing on the seventh circuit um, before you, I guess you dig in full time on the real estate side of things? Is that something uh, you thought about? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, Harry Jones and I have brought uh, a commercial brokerage over to Victoria and we've, we've been running that together with a couple other guys and it's been awesome to, to take the competitive, um, that competitive spirit and work ethic from rugby into a very competitive industry like commercial brokerage. Um, I, you know, I think, uh, I think I don't really have an answer for that. I was going to weigh it up after the Olympics. So this year I'm going to weigh it up after the Olympics. I think that's fair. I don't want to, uh, you know, put too much pressure on you and we're no. announcing here. That <laughs> no, no. I, look, I just, I, I was working my tail off to get there, yeah. uh, to get the Olympics and, and deal with whatever I need to deal with afterwards. Uh, but I am a 30 year old rugby player. There's a, you know, there's an expiry date at some point. Um, yeah. and I definitely want to leave on my own accord. Um, and not, Makes a difference. you know, through, through, you know, a medical professional telling me I need to, or, uh, or a coach telling me that I can't do it. That's another one that I don't want to do. You don't want to be forced out or forced into retirement because of a, a non-selection, but, um, that hasn't happened yet. And I'm just going to continue working hard to try and make this Olympic team do everything I can to get, uh, you know, get over there and perform and then we'll take it from there. That's great. Uh, last thing we're circling back. Think of the name for your movie. Uh, <laughs> call it uh, there's something there I know you want to say it <laughs> I've had a couple that popped in but I'm just not going to say it um, I don't know you're... who is it who is it I'm with Pamela Brad Pitt and Penelope Cruz or Penelope Cruz yeah oh Penelope Cruz <laughs> She's a treat. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just leave Man, it at that. why is this so difficult? I don't <laughs> know. Call it, uh, I don't know. Maybe the Revenant 2. The Revenant 2? Okay. The All Revenant 2. Right. The Revenant Part Just be me dying in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Connor, thanks very much for taking some time to chat with us. And, uh, you know, wish you the best during COVID and in, in your training and uh, can't wait to see you back on the seventh circuit and, and uh, representing Canada at the Olympics next year. Beauty. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers. That was great. Thanks, Connor. It was a lot of fun chatting with you. Uh, great rugby guy, great rugby bloke. Uh, just a real nice uh, all around gentleman. So thank you very much for offering some honest feedback about the, about the game, about yourself and uh, having a few laughs along the way. So thank you very much. Wish you a lot of, a lot of luck and uh, wish you all the best as you train and prep for the 2021 Olympics. I uh, can't wait to see the, can't wait to see you and the, your teammates in action uh, representing Canada and going for the gold over there in 2021. Got a few great guests coming up. Got Tyson Bookaboom on deck. She's our next pod. Gordon McCrory had a good conversation with him last night. He's over in Italy, so he'll be after her. Kyle Bailey and I are still trying to sync up a day. Uh, Mackenzie Thomas and Katie Sinclair. I've got uh, I've got those two zoned in for a for a call. We've got our time scheduled. Uh, Maria Gallo and Marissa Pace. We're still trying to figure out a time as well. Same as Jonathan Kaplan, who is the uh, new current officiating um, director for Major League Rugby, and Harry Jones as well. He and I have chatted a few times. It's just a matter of hooking up where we can actually sit down and do a call and get everything taken care of. But as always, it's been an amazing journey so far. Lots of pods up, lots of pods to come, and it's great that we keep spreading the good rugby word of rugby in Canada on both the men's and women's side, at both the 15s and 7 levels, at both the coaching and playing level at the executive level, like wherever we can go, where we can get these different stories about how fantastic Canadian rugby is, the better. So thank you to all the listeners. 
I truly appreciate it. And I know that I know the players and the pod guests all do as well because it's uh, they see, they see when you retweet and when you like things as well. So make sure that you're liking, make sure that you're retweeting, make sure that you're reposting, make sure that you're resharing and uh, just keep spreading that rugby love around. As always, I get to say thanks to Ben sound music for supplying with our tunes, that little catchy intro and the exit music we have that's uh, free provided by them. As always, uh, feel free to request topics for future podcasts or, you know, who my guest list is if you have any questions. Uh, David Castle has been a great one. He, he's requested a lot of, a lot of different uh, characters to come on, and most of those people have been able to join. So be like David and uh, request a guest or request some questions. I really appreciate those, uh, that feedback. And lastly, this is Jamie. And until next time, we want you to stay safe, Stay healthy, stay sane, and most importantly, keep on rocking. Mm-hmm.